That voice, so familiar, despite the years since she last heard it. It sounded impossibly far away, yet close enough that she swiveled her head in search of its owner. Is that you? The voice, its edges rippling with echoes, was louder, closer. She ran toward the sound, but her feet were heavy, like stone. And there he was. Sahar reached a trembling hand toward her brother she had not seen since she was taken to be trained by the Jedi. As her fingers inched closer, she could see her brother's gaunt face was marred by fear, by hopelessness. Just below, a heavy, rusted chain was tangled around his neck. But the moment Sahar's fingertips brushed the cold metal of his bonds, her vision blurred. A low, pulsing hum grew louder and louder, an unbearable heat washed over her body. She grasped for her brother wildly with both arms, but he crumbled away like dirt and ash at her touch. Sahar desperately called her brother's name as she woke, but the only response was the ceaseless rumbling of a ship's engine. As her vision cleared, the durasteel ceiling of the ship's sweltering lower levels slowly came into view. She was drenched in sweat, her limbs twisted in the rough sheet covering her cot. This was the fifth night in a row she'd had the same dream, spending every single one of her waking hours meditating, reaching out, hoping to find any clue that could lead to her brother was obviously starting to take its toll. But this was the first night where she got close enough to touch Recon and she didn't like what had happened when she did. Was it a sign, or was it her own self-doubt creeping its way into even the subconscious parts of her mind? Sahar shoved the blanket down to the end of her cot and slid onto the floor, legs crossed and back straight. The passenger transport she'd snuck aboard was old and in desperate need of upgrades, but the utility room she'd quietly turned into a makeshift lodgings was close to the engine, and the steady vibrations of the struggling pistons and turbines made falling into a trance easy. She had barely closed her eyes and begun to concentrate when she was in that place again, somewhere deep in her mind, her unconsciousness flowing with the force as she called out to Rikan. Still find your brother. His voice again. The Sith. Malgus. Sahar shook her head and re-centered herself, reaching out desperately. If her dreams were a sign of reality, Rikan needed her now. Focus, Sahar. She felt a sense of comfort wash over her as she remembered some of the first words her master ever said to her. <laughs> Do you know what it is your master just destroyed? Sahar grit her teeth. Malgus's voice was getting louder. Accusations and angry questions fought to the forefront of her mind. It was Master Denolm's fault that her brother was in danger. She pushed Malgus's taunting aside and focused on finding Rikai. All your life you've been in a cage, Padawan. Her eyes snapped open. Her thoughts, her memories of Master Denolm. They were becoming increasingly tainted, corrupted by Malgus's words. And the more she meditated in search of her brother, the more they jostled and crowded her mind like a noxious gas. Short distance from her, wrapped tightly in a tattered cloak she stole, the holocron Sahar found as she slipped away from the ruined temple on Elom began to pulse. The relic was always vibrating with latent energy, but now it was more intense. It was almost signing to her. Did it know? Could it sense what she wanted? Sahar slid over to the other side of her hastily made quarters and slowly unwrapped the holocron. It was glowing, brighter than before, as if it were answering her question. Malgus said it could be the key to finding Rikan, but he couldn't be trusted. Master Denolm said so, but Master Denolm lied too. She wasn't completely clueless when it came to old force relics like this one. Master Denolm was a historian, after all, and she'd lost count of how many they had dug up together. In her experience, there was always a chance that it could hold something dangerous. But more often than not, it was just information. Nothing more, nothing less. What could be so bad about that? This holocron was unlike any other she'd ever seen. Its design was beautiful, intricate, but extremely complex. It felt like it could shatter if someone who didn't know what they were doing tried to handle it. Sahar pressed the edges of the holocron with her fingertips and twisted. Something felt like it gave way, but it stayed firmly closed. She applied more pressure, connecting herself to the relic with the force. She could feel something, a tension, 
inside the holocron building, cresting. So she pushed, and the holocron pushed back. She threw her arms up to shield herself from what felt like a giant crashing wave. The sheer force of it knocked her away from the holocron and onto her back. As she recovered, the holocron's thrumming pulse was quieter. Its glow dimmed. Scrambling to her feet, Sahar fought the urge to scream. She wasn't completely sure the engine noise would hide it, and she didn't want anyone poking their nose in. She pulled her foot back, but her attempt to kick the holocron was interrupted by the grumbling of her empty stomach. It had been a very long time since she last ate. She took a few deep breaths and put her foot back on the floor. She stretched her legs, flexing her ankles and toes. She closed her eyes and tried to sense anyone who might be outside her stowaway's quarters, but she felt nothing. Everyone else must have gone to bed. Carefully, Sahar slid open the door and peered around into the hall. Darkness. Silence. The perfect opportunity to sneak into the galley. As she crept through the dark corridor and up the stairwell, her stomach protested again, urging her to hurry and satisfy it. She hadn't been this hungry since she'd lived on Ossus with Master Denol in a colony full of refugees being built from the ground up. Before they were able to get the farms to produce anything, it was rough. Food was a blessing, and one that had to be shared. Everyone who lived in that colony learned how to make do with next to nothing. But this, stealing supplies, hijacking a shuttle to get away from Elon, stowing away, this was all new. Then again, a lot of the events of the last few days were uncharted territory for Sahar. The galley was as empty as the corridor leading into it. Sahar stepped into it as quietly and slowly as she could. The room was cast in near complete darkness, except for a light someone had thoughtlessly, helpfully, in Sahar's case, left on in one of the pantries. She was halfway to the pantry door when something clattered to the floor. The sound of metal on metal rang throughout the galley, and Sahar froze. A figure appeared in the pantry doorway, outlined by the light inside. She was only a little taller than Sahar, but older. Her brown hair was cropped at the chin, and she stood on two cybernetic legs. Oh, sorry. The woman smiled. I hope I didn't scare you. I didn't think anyone else would be in here. Sahar couldn't find the words to respond. The woman's clothes were plain, unremarkable, but they weren't those of a mechanic or a crew member. She was probably a passenger who wouldn't know or care that she'd just caught a stowaway. I guess I'm not the only one who can't sleep when they're hungry. The woman held up a faded, dented can and a saucepan that had clearly seen better days. I was just going to have some of this garfish stew. I don't think anyone would mind. She peered at the can. I can't believe they even have it. Want some? Sahar slowly nodded and the woman pushed the door open wider. The pantry light fully bathing Sahar's face and the galley's preparation area. Sahar turned and faced away from the woman, willing her pounding heart to slow. She stepped closer to the table near the pantry and gently took down two of the chairs that had been placed on its surface. Thanks, the woman said as she poured the stew into the saucepan. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Soon after, a pungent smell drifted through the galley. Sahar could smell how spicy the dish was as the woman poured two helpings into bowls and set them onto the table. I don't mind eating in silence, the woman said as she sat across from Sahar. But I think dinner is always better with someone else. I'm glad you showed up. Uh, Sahar cleared her throat and pulled a bowl toward her. Tao, my name is Tao. Nice to meet you, Tao. The woman collected some of the stew onto her spoon, blew away the steam and tasted it. Not bad. Sahar had a bite of her own. It was more than not bad. She wasn't sure if it was because she hadn't eaten in days, but it might have been the best thing she had ever tasted. Silence filled the space between them as she devoured the stew. Well, that's probably the biggest compliment my cooking's ever gotten. Sahar couldn't help but smirk. It's really great. Thank you, by the way. Happy to help. The woman took another bite, and as the silence returned, Stretching into the darkness, she swelled her spoon in her half-empty bowl. So, what do you do, Tao? Sahar coughed and tried to cover it with another spoonful of stew. Uh, do? <laughs> Sorry. The woman laughed. When I said dinner is always better with someone else, I really meant I hate awkward silences. Sahar smiled, tight-lipped, desperately hoping it masked her racing thoughts. I'm, uh, I'm a farmer. Wow, really? The woman grinned. Me too. I mean... I was a farmer. Sahar's spoon scraped across the bottom of her bowl. I had to leave. Oh, well, that's a shame. The woman furrowed her brows. Unless it's not. You wanted to do something else? I don't... I don't know, actually. Sahar pushed a now empty bowl to the middle of the table. She could feel the sting of tears ready to well in her eyes, but she gritted her teeth against them. My... 
My father died. He was the one who taught me everything about farming. The woman's face fell. Hitty plainly etched in her expression. Sahar leaned back and crossed her arms over her chest, as if she were raising a shield. I know he would want me to keep going, keep doing everything he showed me how to do, but... Destroy this machine! And all records of it! But I don't know if that's what I want to do anymore. Sahar snapped. I'm sorry. The woman had finished her meal too. Browning, she pushed her empty bowl next to Sahar's. I'm really sorry. I lost my mom when I was young. The woman looked at Sahar with an openness and honesty that Sahar had difficulty recognising. With how much truth had been hidden from her for her entire life, the sight of someone so eager to listen and understand was enticing. I'm sorry too, Sahar swallowed. And my father? How many were left behind? So that the Jedi could play God. He had a lot of secrets that I'm only just now finding out about. They make me wonder if I ever really knew him, if I should have listened to him, if he set me on the right path. That's, that's really tough. There was a tremble in the woman's voice. Believe it or not, I know what that's like too. To have a father who hides things from you, even though he thinks what he's doing is for your own good. Sahar felt a twinge in her chest. What? How did you deal with it? All of that, I mean. Well, it didn't happen right away. There was always something, like a shadow, in the back of my mind. Even after I talked to him about it and got the answers I needed, that shadow always made me ask why he wasn't around. Why wasn't I good enough to get him to stay? You could have saved my brother. The woman stood up and grabbed the two empty dishes. It took me a long time to realize that the choices my father made had nothing to do with me, she said as she carried the bowls to the food preparation area. Even though he swore that he was only off running spice and blasters because he needed the credits for me. <laughs> Protected you. She placed the bowls in an empty dish basin and turned back towards Sahar. Eventually, it hit me. Loving my father didn't mean he was perfect. No one can be, no matter how important they are to you. You must trust me. The woman moved back to the table. Once I figured that out, the other pieces fell into place. My father is only human. He handled misfortune and hardship the way he thought was best. He made choices he thought were right. Even though I don't agree with him, I know I can give him enough grace to understand that. Was I chosen by the Force? The woman sat down across from Sahar again. But that's all I can give him. Love and forgiveness for the past. Beyond that, all that's left is for me. My time and my focus go to what I want to do. Who I want to be. Or you. <laughs> I'm sorry. The woman let out a clipped laugh. I really didn't mean to give you a lecture or anything. She smiled. But it is nice to have someone listen. I know, Sahar replied, barely above a whisper. She wrapped her arms tightly around herself. Now that the comfort of the warm meal was gone, she was intensely aware of the cold that began to creep across her skin. Thank you, Sahar said as she got to her feet, the legs of her chair skidding across the galley's metal floor. But the food, before the woman could answer, Sahar turned and marched toward the galley door. Oh, thank you for the company. Sahar could hear the woman's voice fading behind her. See you around, Tao. As soon as she was enveloped in the shadows of the corridor, she walked faster, back toward her cramped room. The garfish stew suddenly felt like it was a heavy stone inside of her. Her breath came quick and short, like she couldn't get enough air at all, like she was back on Elon, trapped in the ruined temple. Back in her room, Sahar waved her arm, slamming the door shut with the force as she collapsed onto the edge of her cot. Doubled over, she clutched the sides of her head, the woman's words replaying in her mind. All that's left is for me. What I want to do, who I want to be. Sahar felt more lost, more adrift than ever. Being Master Denorm's Padawan was all she knew how to be. He was gone. What was left? Through the pulsing hum of the transport's engines, a smaller, more delicate sound seeped into the air. Sahar looked to the holocron. Sitting a short distance away, it trilled quietly, again and again. Its faint blue glow had returned. Sahar picked the holocron up from where she dropped it. The relic settled easily into her grasp. Do you know what it is? This time, as Sahar worked against the holocron, it felt less resistant, more pliant. It wanted her to see, to understand. It's not too late. You can still find your brother. Rikan, Master Denolm, made the wrong choice. Master Denolm made the wrong choice when he refused to take her brother, and he never told her about Rikan's abilities. Another wrong decision made under the pretense of protecting Sahar. 
gears clicked into place, metal and crystal slid away, the light shining from inside the holocron almost blinding now, projected designs, patterns as elaborate and perplexing as the markings on the outside of the relic on the durasteel walls. Sahar's eyes widened as she scanned the spreading illustrations. In all the time she helped Master Danon with his research, she had never seen anything like this. The only thing that came close were the tattered remains of text they found in the ruined Jedi library they explored together on Ossus. The memories of her dead master's teachings came flooding back, as she started to recognise and piece together what she was seeing. A tear, blistering against her skin, slid down her face. She felt hot, from the inside, like she would burst into flames at any moment. She couldn't be completely sure, but she could see enough to know that the plans in this holocron were different. Whatever the machine on Elom had been, this was something else. Something more. This device wasn't meant to just find forgotten souls, as Malgus suggested the machine Master Denorm had destroyed might do. It was meant to speak to them, to ignite, like kindling something inside them. A loud bang startled Sahar as the holocron hit the floor. The blue glowing plans were all gone, the relic was silent and dark at her feet. Despite all his power, all his knowledge, Master Denorm was still human. He knew what this machine could do. What could happen if she tried to use it, and he did what he thought was best. She could give him forgiveness, understanding. Beyond that, all that was left was for Sahar, who she wanted to be, and what she wanted to do. She couldn't remember the last time Master Denorm had held her gaze so earnestly. I'm sorry. I know, Sahar whispered. The transport's engines hummed in response. It's okay, but I have to do this. Cradled by the sound of the steadily pulsing ship, Sahar sank to the floor. She closed her eyes, pulled her knees to her chest, and listened. Focus, Sahar. Sahar's eyes opened, and the ship was gone. A younger Master Denom sat across from her, on the floor of the orphanage where her life began. Rikan was by her side, bouncing excitedly, grinning, eager to impress the Jedi who came to see them. Master Dinom smiled as he extended his hand, offering a simple toy. Trust yourself, he offered kindly. You can do this. It may be difficult, but it is not impossible. Sahar reached both hands toward the toy, and before she could pull it to herself, recreate what had happened so long ago, she was somewhere else. A well-made but cramped shuttle, the kind the less affluent Republic senators favoured speeding through hyperspace. She used to see them on the occasions Master Denorm took her to Coruscant, the world that they and the rest of the last remaining Jedi were fleeing. This isn't over, Sahar. Master Denorm's voice was strained as he wrapped his cloak around her shoulders. She was still shaking from their clash with the brutal invaders who were tearing their way through the Republic. Suffering like this cannot last forever, and we must be ready to pick up the pieces when it ends. She looked up at his determined face, now silhouetted by the blazing Ossus sun, high in the sky behind them, the soil beneath her knees was dry, cracking. The evidence of her failure to grow a patch of barbaral fruit surrounded them. Master Denolm extended his hand and helped Sahar to her feet. The Force chose you. I chose you. I know how much you are capable of, even if you don't see it yet. He turned and walked away, and Sahar followed. In a few paces, the Ossus Desert gave way to an icy wasteland. She was following him toward the entrance of the temple ruins on Elon. Master Dinorm stopped, his gaze rising to the top of the ruins. Sahar stood at his side. She could sense his fear, the inner struggle to convince himself he was doing the right thing, and the strongest of all, his efforts to push all his hesitation away. But moments will come. When doubts are darkest, when I won't be there to tell you, Master Dinorm turned to her. You will have to tell yourself, to choose yourself, and you will need to believe it. And then he was gone. Elon was gone. Sahar was alone. All around her, nothing but a dusty, lifeless desolation. But in the distance, she could see a dark figure, no bigger than a pinprick on the horizon. She walked toward and the dark figure grew as they approached each other. She could see him clearly now, right in front of her. He was older, different, but she would recognize her brother anywhere. He looked like a fighter, 
strong and powerful, around his neck were the chains Sahar saw in her nightmares, but they were broken, unbound by anything. He smiled at her and extended both his hands. When she reached out to clasp them, there was a knife cradled in his palms. When you're ready, break free. She opened her eyes, but the darkness was still there. The heat and the noise told her she was still on the floor of her space on the transport. The holocron was lit by a soft glow again, dim but steady. The overwhelming, suffocating defeat she'd felt since she escaped Elom was gone. Instead, she could feel a pull in the force, a bond connecting her to her brother, a compass guiding Sahar to Rikan. Sahar stood, grabbed the tattered cloak she'd been hiding the holocron in and draped the cloth over the relic. She bundled it up and stashed it with her few other belongings so she could snatch them up and run as soon as the transport reached its destination in a few days time. When they arrived, she'd have to sneak aboard a new ship, but this time she knew where she was heading. This time she knew what she needed to do and who she needed to be, a warrior, a liberator, a friend, a sister. Sahar lay back on her cot and willed herself to calm down. She would need plenty of rest for the fight ahead. As she relaxed the tension in her muscles, her mind drifted. She thought of Rikan, of Master Dinolm, of the woman in the galley. Before long, her mind eased into sleep, content in knowing that for the first time in a long while, nightmares would not come. <laughs>